2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. And aren't you glad for an anchor for our soul? It's an anchor that's steadfast and sure. And the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 7 that we have such an anchor for our soul. And this morning when everything is upside down, when the world is upside down, when the kids aren't acting right, when work's upside down, I'm glad that there's one thing that never, ever, ever changes. Hebrews chapter 13 said, Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, I've got an anchor for my soul this morning. He's steadfast, he's sure. He was in the beginning with the Father, and his name is Jesus. What a blessing it is to know him personally. Amen, and I'm thankful that you are here this morning. Happy Father's Day um, to you this morning if you are here. And the message this morning, I depart from the series on uh, being a soldier of Jesus Christ for one Sunday. God willing, I'll revisit that and begin back in that next Sunday. God being our helper, if that's what he'd have. But on this Father's Day, I want to bring to you a message, something that the Lord put on my heart probably a week and a half to two weeks ago. And I want you to understand this morning that the message could be taken, uh, could be taken by some as harsh. The message could be taken as hard. But what the preacher is trying to do this morning is charge everyone under the sound of his voice that there is a right and a proper way to be a godly daddy. And can I say this? In the day that we live in, the lines have been blurred as to what God's men should be, but the lines are not blurred in the Bible. And so we need preachers that will stand in the pulpit unapologetically and preach the Word of God. And so this morning, if you had a father that trained you and raised you in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, you ought to raise both hands towards heaven and say, Hallelujah! But maybe it was that you did not have a father that trained you that way. Maybe you had a good dad, but he lacked in the department of training you in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I charge you today, and I'm going to give you some hope at the end of this message, that if you had a dad that lacked in spiritual things, you can break the trend and be the dad that does not lack in spiritual things and train your children in the way they should go. 2 Samuel chapter 21, an excerpt out of the life of David king of all Israel, one who was anointed with a horn of oil, and the Spirit of God came on him from that day forward, and I would to God that you pray for the preacher this morning. Uh, while I do my very best to preach the gospel, I want to be a help and an encouragement to you this morning, and I want God the Holy Ghost to come by and touch our hearts and open our eyes and our ears. An excerpt out of the life of David, he's king of all Israel, anointed by Samuel the priest, and or Samuel the prophet, and the Spirit of God came on, uh, upon him from that day forward. A man who was after the heart of God himself. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 21, and begin reading in verse 1, and I, t I touched this thought about seven years ago or so, and God resurrected my mind to it, and it's not exactly like it was seven years ago, but maybe you've never heard the thought before. Uh, I'll say this, once I heard it one time, it's never left my mind. And so this morning I hope to implant something, implant seed in your mind, That'll never leave your mind ever again. 2 Samuel chapter 21, begin reading in verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make atonement, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul. Saul's dead. Get that. Saul's not alive at this time. And he says, The Gibeonites said, We will have no gold or silver of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, what ye, and what ye shall say that I will do for you? And the Gibeonites answered. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul, verse 9. And he delivered them unto the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of the harvest. 
in the first days in the beginning of the barley harvest. And our Heavenly Father... God, I thank you, Father, Lord, beyond any shadow of a doubt this morning. And you reaffirmed it to me this morning in prayer, Lord, that you've called me. And God, I have no doubt about that. Father, you called me to preach your gospel. And Father, Lord, those you call, you equip. So give me the equipment of the Holy Ghost. Hide me behind your cross. I pray you'd help me to preach in power and in demonstration of the Spirit. Touch my body physically. Help my voice, Father, Lord, that it'd be strong. And God, I pray, Father, most of all, that you'd give me the ear of the listener, Father, no doubt there's listeners, Father, Lord, in this congregation under the sound of my voice that I can see with my eyes. But God, Father, there's untold thousands, maybe hundreds, I don't know, of listeners that'll be listening on television and on radio, Father. And this morning I pray that you take the thought that you've given me, multiply it, may you open ears and hearts and minds, Father, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. In the text, David is leading the children of Israel through a famine. And there's famine in the land of Israel. And during this time, the children of Israel are starving to death. Perhaps folks are dying. Perhaps there's children whose ribs are showing because they don't have enough to eat. Can I say this very quickly and very plainly? Famine can bring on tragedy. Americans know nothing about famine. Somebody say amen. Famine can bring on tragedy so much so that in 2 Kings chapter 6, and verse 25, there was a great famine in Samaria. We're reading about a famine in the time of David, but in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 25, in the time of Elisha the prophet, there was a famine in Samaria, and I'm talking about famine bringing on tragedy. And, verse, and 2 Kings 6, 25, And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung was sold for five pieces of silver. People were eating the heads of donkeys and doves dung and it was going at a premium price because they were all starving to death. And yes, that's in your Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 20, 28, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give me thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. Somebody said, That is very graphic. Yeah, but it's in the Bible. And it just shows you what can happen when people get in such a place, in such a point, that they're starving starving to death, that they will go to the ends of the earth to eat whatever they can. May I pause and say, we've been blessed in America. We're, hey, there's not a one of us more than likely that wondered uh, where we were going to get our next meal from. And in Israel, uh, at the time that the text was written, there had been famine for three years. Year after year, for three years, folks were wondering, is this going to get any better? So David the king goes uh, to the Lord and he seeks him out to find out why there is a famine in the land of Israel. Verse 2 in the text, the Bible says, The famine is due to Saul and to his bloody house and for him slaying the Gibeonites. Let me pause and say now that Israel, people down in Israel are starving to death. People's ribs are stuck together. People uh, do not have the food that they need to be able to be nourished. And when David the king goes to uh, God and inquires of him why it is going on, he says, it's not because of anything you did. It's not because of the things that are going on in Israel right now. As a matter of fact, one man's actions, the actions of a man, listen to me carefully, are you there? Say amen. As a matter of fact, one man's actions, the actions of a man who is already dead, who has already uh, died and fell on his own sword, is affecting multitudes. The children of, Israel's are, children of Israel are starving to death. Their stomachs are growling, not because of what they did, but because of somebody before them and what they did. They are starving to death because of what Saul did. You see, years before... King Saul had tried to eradicate the Gibeonites, which was a tribe of people from Israel. Take this down if you're taking notes. The action violated the covenant that Joshua had made with the Israelites years before in Joshua chapter 9 when Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites that they would not be slain as a direct result of Saul slaying the Gibeonites, breaking that covenant. If you, you got to listen in to stay with me. As a de direct result of Israel breaking their covenant, God sent famine upon on Israel for three years, now David calls the Gibeonites and says, What can I do for you? How can I make atonement for this? And in verse 6, they answer him. Look what your Bible says in verse 6. Remember, Saul is already dead, but he slew the Gibeonites. And there was a pact made or a covenant made between Joshua and between the Gibeonites that Israel would not slay them. And Saul went against the covenant. And by the way, we ought to be men of our words. 
And now then we find in verse 6, David says, How shall I atone this? And in verse 6 of 2 Samuel 21, let seven men of his sons. He's already dead, but because of what he done, we can't make retribution to him, so we'll let it go on down his bloodline. Are you with me? Say amen. And he says, how shall we make retribution? Verse 6, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up. Under the Lord of Gibeon, Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. We find in verse 8, who seven of these men are. Two of Saul's sons were born to Rizba, which is Saul's concubine. Two of them were Rizba's, who was Saul's concubine. And we find five of Saul's grandsons. Somebody said, well, that's not his sons. Well, my, my daddy's here this morning. And every time he looks at my son, he says, come on, son. And that's his grandson, and it's down his bloodline. And I'm telling you right now, in verse, uh, verse 7, we find two of the Saul's sons were born to Rizba, Saul's concubine, and five of his grandsons uh, to his daughter, Michal. And in verse 9, all seven of those sons fall together. They've got a noose around their neck. I can almost see them right now, Scott, as they're looking at each other, and they're thinking to themselves, what did we ever do? They've got a noose around their neck. They drop, and they all fall dead. That's what your Bible says. Somebody say amen. They all fall dead right there and they fall and hang and they're dead because of their bloody house and because of their father's sin. Look up here at me and listen. What daddy does matters. What daddy does matters. And that's what I'm preaching this morning. What daddy do does matters. You see, I could take just a few minutes and build Saul up quite easily in your mind. You see, the Israelites wanted a king, and they wanted a king, and they kept on. We've got to have a king. We've got to have a king. First Samuel chapter 9 and verse 2, they chose a choice, man, and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than thee, him. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. When the Israelites chose Saul as their king, he looked the part. Can he look like a king? When you seen him, Michael, he was head and shoulders above all. And so I could build him up in your, uh, your mind. And I could talk about how all the people reverenced the king. In 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 24, And Samuel said unto all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted. I can almost see him, Daddy. There they are. They chose the king. He looks the part of the king. And in 1 Samuel 10, 24, here's what the Israelites say. God saved the king. They respected King Saul, but everything I said about their respect, every look up here at me, everything I said about what Saul did in his later years proved to me nothing. Because Saul started off the right way. He looked the part of the king. He had the respect of the people. But later on in his life, he proved that it wasn't all about God, it was all about him. We find his self will. When he made a burnt offering, instead of waiting on Samuel when the Philistines were upon him, and people of Israel were distressed, and they hid themselves. In 1 Samuel 13, 12, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. He wasn't supposed to be offering a burnt offering. He said, I'll get ahead of God. Verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. Not only was he self-willed, but in 1 Samuel chapter 15, he was disobedient when Samuel told him to go down to the Amalekites, smite everything that is down there, and he took the very best of the spoil, the very best of the animals, the king Agag he took them alive, so not only was he filled with self will, not only was he disobedient, but he was full of jealousy and hatred, I'm telling you that jealousy and hatred, look up here at me and listen very carefully, jealousy will destroy your walk with the Lord if you look at somebody else and you say, well what about how people are treating them and they're not treating me, do you realize that's exactly what happened to Saul there was some maidens talking about David talking about how great of a king he was 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 8 and they ascribed unto David ten thousands but unto me they have only ascribed thousands Bruce he was jealous of David because they said David was a better king than he was David was a more valiant warrior than he was and in 1 Samuel 19 1 Saul spake to Jonathan his son and said to all his servants that they should kill David he started off right but ended up in superstition 1 Samuel 28 and verse 7 then said Saul unto his servants seek 
make me a woman that has a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman with a familiar spirit, a witch, if you would, and indoor. Look up here at me and listen very carefully. Leave witchcraft alone. That's how Saul finished. Bad, and you know how it all ended up? Started with self-will, ended with suicide. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 31, 4, Then said Saul to his armor bearers, Draw thy sword and thrust through me therewith, lest these uncircumcised Philistines come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, and he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and he fell upon it. I'm talking about a man that started right, looked the part, had the respect of the people, but because he had his own self-will, because, listen to me carefully, because he wouldn't be obedient to God, because he was more concerned about him, he ended up really, really bad. And I'm telling you, his, pa- his sons and his grandsons paid for his actions and I'm telling you right now what Saul did mattered because his children were watching his children were watching now his children after he is dead and gone are still paying for what daddy did Exodus chapter 34 if you take your notes take it down some of you looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate Exodus chapter 34 And verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. Listen carefully. Keeping mercy for thousands. Exodus 34, 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and sin and transgression, that he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers. It's okay if I read the Bible from the pulpit, ain't it? Visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. And upon children's children, that's grandchildren. Upon children's children under the third and the fourth generation. What that verse is saying is, is what daddy does matters. If he chooses to live right and to do right and live righteous and follow after the heart of God, the Bible says that his children will follow after him. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 20 and verse 7, the just man, that's the justified man, walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. I want to stop and say how thankful I am for a man that was just that raised me and I'm trying my best to the following the footsteps of my father, not only earthly, but heavenly. But if you're not going the right way, don't tell me that the way you're training your kids won't matter. Don't tell God that it won't because the Lord said in his book in Exodus 34 that he will visit the iniquity of fathers upon children and upon children's children to the third and fourth generation. And somebody said, does that mean I have to pay for my daddy's sin? No, that means you're watching. He, uh, they're watching what you're doing and more than likely they're following your footsteps. But can I say this, and I'll get to it at the end of the message, you can be a trend breaker and every one of us have got free will to do whatever it is the Holy Spirit guides us to do if we will only do it. What daddy does matters. By the verbiage of verse 1 in, your te- in the text, we find that Saul's sons and his grandsons followed his example. Look at it. Verse 1, it's for Saul and his bloody house. Not only did his sons pay for his sins, but they followed in his footsteps. They followed in his footsteps. And I warn you this morning, get this thing of being a daddy right. Get this thing of being a daddy right. By the way, childbirth and conception is still a miracle of God. And now you are not be taught. And in the day that we live in, everybody thinks, oh, we can do this and we can do that. And we've got AI and all this different kind of thing. I'm telling you right now, conception is a miracle from God above. And if God's blessed you with children, get it right. So how, how can I be the dad God wants me to be? Take it down, number one. Take it down, number one. How can I be the dad God wants me to be? And some of you are going to get in the conviction in this message. I did. I did. Write down number one. Spend time with your kids. Spend time. Spend time. Spend time with your kids. Ephesians 5.15 See therefore that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time. You don't have another minute than I do, Michael. We've got 24 hours in this day. I don't have another minute than you do, Daddy. It's all about how we spend it, Scott. 
And a lot of us daddies, we get so busy and preoccupied with what we think is important. And I'm not saying that it's not important that we let things go. Look up here. I'm not praying. I'm preaching. We get so preoccupied about things that, that, that we think are so important and that the world can't do without us and our job can't do without us. And the next thing you know, we have let things that matter most go. A man came home from work late one night. He was tired and he wanted a shower and food. Does, any, does that sound familiar? He came home. Nobody's asleep right now. He came home and all he wanted was a shower and food and he walked in and there was his five-year-old son. And his five-year-old son said, Daddy, how much do you make an hour? He said, I make $10 an hour. He said, hmm. He said, can I borrow $5? Well, number one, Chad, his daddy was tired. Secondly, he was hungry. And those two things together in a man's life that's worked 12 hours is enough to set every one of us off. Somebody say amen now. Can I borrow $5, Daddy? No, I'm not giving you $5 because all you're going to do is waste it on some stupid toy and uh, uh, blow it on something that you don't need anyway. He said, I can't believe you'd be so selfish as to ask me that. Now go to your room, sit there, and think about what you've done and how selfish you are. About five minutes passed, the daddy scratched his head and he thought, hmm, he don't ask for money much. Maybe he really does need something. He walked into his son's room. And there his boy laid on his side. He said, son, here's the five dollars. Maybe I was a little bit too hard on you and a little bit too impatient. Here's the five dollars. He said, oh, good. He said, thank the Lord. And he pulled another $5 bill out from under his pillow. Tears began to come down those rosy red cheeks. He said, Daddy, now I finally got it. $10. Can I buy one hour of your time? Can I buy one hour of your time? And Caleb, I have to be honest. When I read that story, it put me under instant conviction. Why? Because I've been that daddy before that was busy and had my mind and my eyes on the big picture. I'm not talking about playing games. I'm talking about working for the betterment of my family. But sometimes, daddies, we need to put it all down because it's just a little bit of time. You know how children spell love? T-I-M-M. E. Somebody said, you're making me uncomfortable, preacher. No, I'm not. I'm just delivering the mail. The Lord's making you uncomfortable. Children spend, spell love. T-I-M-E. Do you realize the average five-year-old spends 25 minutes a week interacting with their father? 25 minutes a week. That's about three and a half minutes a day. And that same child averages 25 hours a week watching television. So I'm asking the question this morning, who's cultivating the mind and the morals of our children, Hollywood or fatherhood? Something to think about. If the father takes the first step towards Christ, listen carefully. If the father takes the first step towards Christ, coming to receive Christ and becoming a man of God, 70% of the time the entire family will follow. If the daddy leads. Look up here, men. If the daddy leads. There's a lot of men that are failing God because they're letting mama lead. And God never designed it to be that way. She should not lead you to church. You ought to lead her. And by the way, your kids will see that. And there'll come a day when they'll look at you and say, Daddy, how come Mama comes and you don't? They'll see that and they'll become a product of what you are. Amen. Boy, it's quiet in here. 70%. 70% of the time the entire family will come to Jesus Christ and be saved. But if the mother only is a believer, the percentage drops down to 15% of the time. 15% 15% of the time, it has been said that if you want your children to turn out well, spend twice as much time with them and half as much money. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I like this quietness. As a matter of fact, it may make me break from my notes and get real. 
I said, here's what I said. I said, if you want your children to turn out right, spend half as much money on them and twice as much time. How much are you there? I said, oh, I'll just put a hundred out there and that'll take care of everything. You know, there's a little two-letter word that will change your children's lives and yours. Watch this. No. No. You know what happens when they get everything they want and all you do is throw money at them? You raise a spoiled brat and they can't, you can't stand them and neither can anybody else. Spend half as much money on them and twice as, twice as much time, give them the most valuable possession you have in your dispensary, and that is your time. You ever heard of a man named Brooks Adams? Probably the answer is no. His father was the ambassador to Great Britain under Abraham Lincoln. Brooks recalled this. He said, the best day of my life is when I was growing up and the day that, the day that my daddy took me fishing. He stopped everything he was doing to take me fishing. He said, I remember we talked, we walked together, we spent time together, and time and time and time again, Brooks recalled that wonderful day when his father took him fishing. Years later, uh, his historian was going through Ambassador Adams' papers and he found the diary in which that day was mentioned and Brooks' father read it, wrote it this way, went fishing today with my son, the whole day was wasted. Why? Because he couldn't get done what he thought he needed to. I'm still preaching about spending time with your kids. I wonder how many wasted days have come and gone that were monumental days in the lives of our children that we never knew about. I wonder how many things we were going to do but never got around to doing that might have changed the life of our children. Bo Jackson, how many remember him? Raise your hand. Bo Jackson, you remember him? If you're a child of the 80s, you will. He was a, he was a dual sports uh, star. And Bo Jackson talks about the times that he he uh, done so good on the football field playing for the Raiders and said he would be in that locker room, Daddy. And he said all the other uh, football players' dads would come in there and they would pat him on the back and say, Good job, son. Glad that you were here. But Bo Jackson would sit over in the corner and cry because his daddy was available to come, was able to come, but never showed up. How can I be the dad God wants me to be? Can I say this as dad... As dads, our children will use us as a role model whether we like it or not. What you are doing right now is leaving a legacy. You are training them what you are. If I were to tell you to take a piece of paper out and write down what you are, I'm not talking about what you think you are. I'm talking about what you are. That is what your children see. And if we want to be good, godly dads, we've got to spend time with our children. Abel left a legacy in, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, or Hebrews chapter 11, and this being by, by it, that legacy, he being dead, yet speaketh. And so Abel left a good legacy. Saul left a bad one. Spending time with your children. Number two, how can I be the dad God wants me to be? Not only to spend time, but scripturally train your kids scripturally train. I'm not talking about training them in all the wrong. Hey, by the way, let me ask you a question. What is our source of truth? You ever heard somebody say, oh, that's not right. Oh, we're not doing that. That ain't right. Well, how do you know? If you don't have anything to compare it to, you don't know what's right and what's wrong. I take the Word of God as the absolute authority in my life. And what's scary to me is that a lot of people do not that sit in churches every Sunday morning. Not only should we spend time with our kids, but we should scripturally train our kids and you train your kids to be what you are. And this is a lifestyle. This is not something that you can do in one day. It's something that you do day in and day out. We need to train them to be uh, humble, not proud. We need to train our kids to be gentle, not debaters. <laughs> do you realize that the Bible tells us not to be debaters? And it puts a black mark. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 1, a mark of a reprobate is that they're debaters. Nobody likes a debater. Somebody said, well, I've got something to fight for. Take it up with God. He said in Romans 1 that it was a mark of a reprobate. And it puts off a bad stench in the air. Amen. Puts off a bad stench in the air. And so, be meek, not brawlers, quiet spirited, not tail bearers. Teach them respect. Or they won't have respect for anything else. Somebody, anybody or anybody, anything else. Somebody said, what's wrong in America? What is the problem in America? Somebody said, you're going to get political now. No, I'm not. I'm going to get spiritual. What's wrong with America? 1962, prayer in public schools was declared unconstitutional. 
1963, Bible reading in public school declared unconstitutional. My daddy can still remember when they took the... That tells your age, daddy. They, my daddy can still remember when they took a Bible out and they had Bible reading in school. Ken Mullis is raising his hand right now or shaking his head right now. Can still remember when there was Bible reading in school. Today you take a Bible out to most children and they say, what is that? 1973, a killing of unborn children declared to be a right of guarantee by the Constitution. 1980, the Ten Commandments named to be an illegal... To be posted on the schoolhouse walls. Somebody said, you're an old fogey. No, I'm just saved. I just believe the Bible. What's the result of 1962, 63, 73, and 1980? And all the years and times past, what's the result? With prayer out of schools, policemen are in. Somebody said, we've got to staff our schools with policemen. Have you ever heard of such? Prayer got out of school, policemen got in. With Bibles out, values, clarification is in. Now we're trying to take Bibles out and we don't have a source of truth. Therefore, we run around teaching boys that they, should, they were born girls and teaching girls that they were born boys. Amen. That's where we're at. I've seen a whole television program on it this morning. Somebody said, this makes me uncomfortable. That's okay. It's still the truth. I've seen a whole television program on TV this morning about gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria. Let me read you what that is. A sense of unease that a person may have because of a mis mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. A mismatch between what they identify. They didn't have no say in the matter. Somebody said, what's wrong with America? That kind of garbage. And now over in the, in the state or the land or whatever it is of California that, by the way, is burning up and falling into the sea. In that place over there, they say, we're going to let the children choose whether or not they can have a sex change before they're 18. And you may be sitting here listening to me right now. Man, I'm fixing to come unhooked. You may sit here listening to me right now and say, oh, that's their right. Are you kidding me? Gag a maggot off a gut wagon. That's what's wrong with America. Some of our dads need to stand up and say, No, son, you were born a male and you're going to be one. Amen. Amen. Not hard enough on our kids. Instead, we pat them on the head and we say, It's okay, little Aubrey. If you think you're a man, that's okay. Are you kidding me? In the beginning, amen. In the beginning, God created them male and female. And God is against a sissyish looking man. Hope you got that in your notes. There used to be a time when you could tell if a man was a man from 50 yards away. Come unscripted, that's all right. There used to be a time when a woman looked like a young lady and she was feminine looking. By the way, somebody said, well, I'll look and dress and act any way I want. Oh, I know you will, I can tell. And it makes me wonder who your God is. Amen? Christians ought to look right and act right. Men ought to look like men. Somebody said, I don't like you preaching. That's all right. Classify yourself with the devil and come back next Sunday. I'm telling you right now, men ought to look like men. We ought to look right. We're to look like men. Take down 1 Corinthians 6, 19. The Bible says, the effeminate shall not. Effeminate, that's a Bible. That's a good Bible word. Everybody Okay. The effeminate, somebody said, I don't like you preaching, neither does the rest of the galaxy. That's all right, I'm going to keep preaching it. You don't have to come back next Sunday, but I have good idea. There's some that will. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the, in, the effeminate, let me give you an education, that's a man that thinks he's a sissy boy. This preaching makes people mad, know it. I hope I've got some of you men that are men, if I need you. I end up on Sparta Live and Fox or I won't end up on Fox News. I may. Who knows? CNN. Amen. Everybody okay? The Bible says that the effeminate shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You teenagers look up here at this preacher. I know y'all all think I'm crazy. You say you're screaming and hollering and shouting. Boys, look up here. Every one of you look up here. You were born. If you were born with boy parts, you're a boy. God determined that before you was ever born. And I don't care who tells you different, they're a liar. Amen. The Bible says the effeminate, that's a man that wants to be a woman. 
Somebody said, they're around, just open your eyes. The effeminate shall not inherit. I've got to move. The effeminate shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And what we have in America is a bunch of boys that think they're girls and a bunch of girls that think they're boys. And the reason that we have that is because the American pulpits are a void of power and truth. And it all starts in the home. Somebody said, it's your, it's your fault, preacher. No, I'm going to point at you and say, it's your fault, daddy. If it starts in the home, you'll have your children in a church where they'll preach against something. And they'll preach for something. And it'll be what the Bible says. And I'm telling you right now, we need men in this congregation, men in America, who will scripturally train their kids. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. In other words, he'll never get away from it. I say that there's been seeds planted in this congregation in this last week in Bible school that kids will never get away from. Ephesians 6, 4, and your fathers. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know what it is. I can't get off of this. You know what it is for a daddy or a mama to pat their kid on the head when they're wrong? You don't, you're not showing them how much you love them. When you don't hold any kind of standard and anything goes, you're not showing them anything except to be a rebel. Except when they go to school and the teacher tells them they're wrong, they'll say, No, I'm not. Mama and daddy said I was right. Those are the ones that need a paddling. If they get trained at home, as a matter of fact, my daddy always said this. He said, son, if you get in trouble at home and you bring a note home, you're getting a spanking. He said, those people down there know me. Those teachers know me. And if I would have, I could, I, I could not imagine. I cannot get this in my brain, Scott. I cannot imagine taking a note home to my daddy at eight years old and saying, Daddy, here you go. The teacher, she didn't treat me right. He'd have laughed in my face. He said, if you would have been acting right, you would have never got a ton note home. Hey Amen. Some of you won't be back next Sunday. That's okay. You pat little Bobby on the head and say everything. He's a child and he needs training. And he needs training, scriptural training. We must discipline our children. Listen to me. Some folks need to get their kids under control. Amen. And we'll start from the pulpit. 1 Timothy 3, 4. You know a bishop is one that's to rule his own house well. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. Can I say this? If it starts in the pulpit, then it goes down from there. And I'm telling you right now, we need to remember that discipline is part of making a disciple. Why is it we come to church? Dwayne Green told me one time, he said, when he first came from West Virginia, he said, Brian, you're just the kind of preacher I like. I brought my steel toe shoes today. I'm glad a preacher stood in the pulpit and told me the difference in right and wrong. Amen? I'm glad for a daddy that told me the difference in right and wrong. And I'm telling you right now, we need to be those type of parents. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. I said, I didn't realize the Bible was such a hard book. It's not if you'll do it. It'll change your life. It will change your life. I'd say I'll get several cuss letters in the mail after this goes on TV. Somebody said, you have that happen? It's happened before. I'm telling you that I'm not moving off what the Bible says, and that's why America is in the shape she's in. Amen. Chasing thy son while there is hope. You can't spank an 18-year-old boy and, I, and expect him to quit doing what he's doing. You take care of that while he's little. Proverbs 13, 14, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. You say, I don't spank my kids. I love them too much. No, the Bible says you hate them. If you're going to go to this church, you're going to hear about child discipline. Somebody said, I won't go to this church. Well, there's a bunch that will pet you on the head and tell you how good you are. I'm going to preach the Bible. And the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes or early. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod of reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. There's a reason some mamas have to walk in school like this. And the other ones walk in there high-headed like this. 
ready to fight. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 13, with no, withhold not correction from a child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Our heavenly Father chastens us. The worst spanking I ever got did not come from him. The worst spanking I ever caught come from my God. My heavenly father, and he chastens me betimes. Or often, a good father, get this down in your notes, a good father knows the value of this book as well as a buck, and he's not afraid to use the belt. Man, I feel lonely up here. One man who attained a high school posi- high position in life attributed to his, two success, or his success to two factors. He said, I was brought up at the knees of a devoted mother and across the knees of a determined father. A good father knows the value of, a book, of, of this book, the book, and he's not afraid to use the belt. Be careful how you discipline. Listen to me carefully. Never discipline your children out of anger. Never discipline your children out of anger. You know that you can discipline your children with this tone? You know, screaming don't do a whole lot. <laughs> Boy, I'm hitting her. I said, screaming don't do a whole lot. You can discipline your children without changing the tone of your voice. If they understand what authority is, and they understand who's in charge. And we need to scripturally, and I'm preaching the Bible. And if I'm not, meet me outside and let me know that I'm not. Because I'm out of order. If I'm not, I'm trying to give you scripture for what I'm saying. Be careful how you do it. And don't do it in anger. Mom and dad and the two boys were on their yearly vacation to Florida. And things were so wonderful. Everything was going so good. Until Bobby looked over at Johnny and they started fighting. And Bobby looked over at Johnny. And Bobby said, that was mine. You stole it. Give it back. And Johnny smacked Bobby in the cross the face. And the next thing you know, it was all out war in the back seat. That went on for a hundred miles. They kept on and on and on. Daddy kept looking at them in the rearview mirror. Daddy's blood began to boil. Daddy started getting madder and madder and madder. And he finally pulled the car over. And he said, all right, both of you outside right here on the side of the road right now. He jerked both of them up. He spanked them. He put them back in the car. And he said, not another word out of either one of y'all for the next 30 minutes. 30 minutes passed by. Those boys didn't make a peep. 31 minutes came. He said, all right, boys, y'all got anything to say for yourselves? Bobby said, yeah, Daddy. I couldn't say anything for 30 minutes, but my shoe came off when you were spanking me. (laughs) I had to do something to lighten the room. I've had things like that happen before. Don't discipline out of anger. What am I trying to say? I'm telling you that the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And the word followers means to mimic. Your children mimic what they see. And if you're a fake, your kids know it. And your children mimic what you see. Proverbs 4, you, I, I'm going to read it. You don't have to go there, but Proverbs 4. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, verses 1 through 4, Hear ye children the instruction of the Father. And attend in no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Forsake not my law, for I was my father's son. That Solomon writing about David, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. David taught Solomon something. And he said, attend, we need to listen to the instruction of our fathers and some instruction. Hey, listen to some instruction of wise fathers. Get this, here's some instruction of wise fathers. A closed mouth gathers no feet. Cut, measure twice, cut once. My daddy told me that not too long ago. After I'd already made the mistake and it was past fixing. Measure twice, son. Cut once. The second time you get kicked in the head by a mule, it is not a learning experience. Well trained is the son who can hang on to his father's words like he can a fly ball. Well trained is the son that can hang on to his father's words like he can a fly ball. And it is my 
great desire and determination that my children not turn out religious. I don't want religious kids. I don't want kids that say, oh, it's church time again. I want children that say, I love God. And I've got a relationship with Him. And when I do wrong, the Holy Ghost lets me know that I'm wrong. I want kids that are not religious, but kids that are saved and born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Kids who know what it is to have a relationship, and not only a relationship, but a fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, God wants men that spend time with their children. God wants men that scripturally train them, their children. Number three, and write this down. God wants men that will submit themselves to God. Submit themselves to God. Let me ask you, sir, how's your life? How submitted are you to the Lord? Somebody said, well, how do I know what the Lord wants me to do? Do you know how I know, Caleb, that I'm supposed to tithe? Malachi chapter 3 is one reason I know I'm supposed to tithe. The Bible talks about giving our offerings in the New Testament and, I, and giving them on the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians 16. And so there's things that I know about that I'm supposed to be doing because I read it in the Bible. Do you realize that God told Saul to go down to Amalek and smite everything there? And he did not do it. He came back, brought the best of the spoil, brought the king, and he said, I've performed the commandment of the Lord. I've done everything God told me to do. And he lied and he knew it. Samuel looked at him and said, What's the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen? He said, For us to rebel, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 23, for us to bet, rebel is witchcraft. And I believe we've got a lot of fathers in our day that are sitting in church houses that know what they should be doing. They know they ought to be giving a tithe unto the Lord. And then when the offering plate passes, their kids are sitting there looking to see what their daddy's going to do, and he lets it go on by. They get up in the mornings, they need to see if their daddy's going to read their Bible, and he lets it go on by. They see if their daddy's going to pray, and maybe it's time to eat, and they've never heard their daddy pray over a meal one time. But they hear other men in the, con other men in the congregation. They hear other men at the supper table pray over the meal, and they scratch their head and they go, Why don't my daddy pray? Somebody say amen. It's the truth. God wants daddies to submit themselves to God. And contrary, and it's fixing to get really real, contrary to popular belief in uh, the secular day that we live in, there is still a biblical order in the home. And the reason that all kinds of homes are in disrepair and out of order is because they've not got a scriptural order in their home. Somebody says, well, I can't have a scriptural order in my home because my wife won't do it or my husband won't do it. Yes, you can. What is the scriptural order? I'm telling you, God don't bless rebels. God didn't bless Saul. And God don't bless rebels. Joshua made a decision for his house in Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amazing to me, he never went to Miss Joshua and said, Miss Joshua, how do you feel about us serving the Lord? He never went to the kids and said, All right, kiddies, do you think it's okay if we serve the Lord? Joshua made the decision, Will. Joshua said, get up, get ready, we're going to church, and we're going to be at Sunday school. Amen. Because kids, you need to learn something. Somebody said, well, my wife won't get out of bed. Leave her in there. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said, and God does not bless rebels. Ephesians 5.22 says that the father is the leader in the home, and it is his duty. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Ephesians 5.22, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. There is a lot of women who try to be a spiritual leader in their home, and a lot of the reasons they do is because they're no good for nothing. Husband will not. There's nothing more beautiful to me than a woman who is in her scriptural place. This is not taught much anymore. This is not taught much anymore. And as a result, homes are in disrepair. And as goes the home, so goes the church. 
Somebody said, boy, I just cannot stand our president. I can't stand our lawmakers. Let me ask you something, sir. If that's your attitude, maybe it is. How's your own home going? You can bark and complain all you want to, but when it comes down to the bottom line, people are looking to see what you're doing at home. And that shows up in your wife. It shows up in your children. It shows up in the things that you do and the things that you choose not to do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven three. but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And I'm asking you right now, sir, is Christ your head? It'll make a difference in the way you live. It'll make a difference in the way you treat your wife. It'll make a difference in the way you treat your children. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Genesis 3.16 The woman said unto him, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in the conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. Ladies, you cannot begin to be. You cannot begin to be the woman that God would have you to be unless you're a submission to your own husband. Sir, you cannot begin to be the man that you should be for God unless you're in submission to Christ. And footnote, your wife knows if you are or not. And therein lies the reason that the pastor that you're looking at right now has been behind closed doors over and over and over in marriage counseling. Because there's some sort of problem with the order at home. Look up here at me. Every eye up here on the preacher. If you've got problems in your home, the first thing the preacher's going to ask you, and the first thing I think God was asking you is, what kind of order is it in? And when it is out of order, everything is out of order. I'm telling you that God has a system. He has rules. And it's not to be mean. It's not to hurt you. Adrian Rogers said one time, when God says thou shalt, he's saying help yourself. When he says thou shalt not, he's saying don't hurt yourself. Women in submission to their husbands. Husbands in submission to Christ. Kids. In submission to their mothers and daddies. That simply means that when you take Johnny to Walmart and he sees the toy that he wants and you say no, he turns around and keeps walking. Somebody said, That's impossible. No, it's not. It is not impossible. Am I speaking Chinese? Y'all okay? It's not impossible. You teach him that at home. And then when you teach them that at home, they won't act up at Walmart. When I see a kid fall down on the floor and flop like a fish, I think, you know what I think to myself? I don't think that kid's a brat. I think to myself, they let him do that at home. And the reason they can't do anything with him at Walmart is because they let him do that at home. Because they won't submit themselves to God and chasing their children while they can. And I'm telling you that God has an order and He does not bless rebels, women in subjection to their own husbands, husbands in subjection to the Lord. Children, obey your parents. It's in the Bible. Some of you teenagers think you're going to be all rebellious. You say, my mom and daddy don't know anything. You'll be amazed what they know in about 15 years. And it could save you a whole lot of trouble, teenagers, if you'll listen right now. Not to mention God says you're supposed to. And it could save you a whole lot of trouble. I'm almost done. I'm asking you the question this morning, are you spending time with your children? Scripturally training your children. Submitting yourself unto God. Lastly, good dads are dads that someday tread the streets of gold with their children. Someday, turn your Bible to Revelation 21. Someday, tread the streets of gold with their children. Revelation chapter 21. You know this all ends up one of two ways. Do you realize everything you do on this earth 
Some of you are turning, some of you are not turning. And those that are not turning, look up here. Do you realize that this all ends up, this whole thing ends up one of two ways? Either you accept Christ as your Savior, you live for Him, and one day when you die, you make heaven your home, or you reject Christ as Savior as an act of your own free will and in hell like the rich man, you lift your eyes. Listen to me, there is no purgatory. I don't care what the Catholics say, it's a lie out of hell. There's no in between. There is heaven and hell. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I'm glad one day I got saved when I was eight. The Lord got my attention, filled me with the Holy Spirit when I was 19 and you can look at me right now and I can honestly declare to you upon the authority of God's word I'm as good for heaven as if I'm already there I'm sure I'm saved and I know it I know in whom I believe I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day I'm on my way to heaven what will it be like Revelation 21 10 John the revelator in the spirit on the Lord's day and he carried me away into the spirit into a great high mountain and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And the Bible said in verse 11, Having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great wall and high and twelve gates. And the gates were twelve angels and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 21, and the Bible says, And the twelve great gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was of pure gold. Do you see that? Ken, one day I'm going to a place that has streets paved with what we deem precious. Bandy bought me this wedding ring 20 years ago. You know how precious that thing is to me? It hadn't been off my finger except when I was fiddling with it and playing with it. Dropped it in an air vent one time. That was a disaster. But I never take it off. It's precious to me. It's pure gold. And you know what's happened to the value of it in 20 years? I took it to my jeweler the other day. Bandy paid $100 for it. It's worth about 800 now. Just one little simple band. And the things that we deem precious, Jeff Walker, in this life, people look at gold and they say, that's precious. People say, the American dollar's no good. I'm going to buy a bunch of bricks of gold. They talk about how gold, how precious gold is. Do you realize if you're saved, you're going to a place that God uses the precious things, the things we deem precious, as building material? Look what he says in verse 12, 21. And it was as transparent glass, and I saw no temple therein. The Lord thy God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of there, thereof. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. This ought to excite you. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. And there shall be no night there. And, there shall be, and, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Hallelujah. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, nor that maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're saved, raise your, hand, raise your hand. One day I'm walking streets of gold. It encourages me. It helps me. And I'm telling you, if you're the father God would have you to be, you'll be a father that will someday tread the streets of gold with your kids. Let me ask you a question. How can you be the right example to your children if you're not saved? How? How can you be the right example to your kids if you are not born again? You want your children to go to heaven, right? I don't believe there's a person under the sound of my voice that would say, No, preacher, I don't want my children. You want your children going to heaven. Well, guess what? A big, uh, a big majority and the, and the chance of them going to heaven has a lot to do with what they see in you. Sure did in Saul's life. If you're not willing to swallow your pride, submit yourself unto the Lord. It is impossible to be the spiritual leader that you should be. I'm done. I want you to listen real carefully as I conclude. Listen carefully. Fathers, the Bible says, fathers are the glory of their children. Fathers are the glory of their children. Proverbs 17, 16, children's children are the crown of old men. My daddy's got a couple of crowns in the auditorium. Grandchildren are the crown of of old men, the Bible says, and the glory of children are their fathers. The glory of children are their fathers. You ever heard somebody say this? He's just like his daddy. 
He's just like his daddy. Let me ask you something. If they said that today, he's just like his daddy. Examine yourself right now, sir. If they said your son was just like their daddy, would that be a good thing in God's eyes? Would it? Would it be a good thing in God's eyes? I was talking to Tyler Brewer on the phone last Sunday before he started his chemotherapy treatments. And I started talking to him. Now, I've known his daddy for 20 plus years, I guess, 15 at least. And I took my phone and turned it up to make sure I was talking to Tyler and not Brian. Because Brian, when I talked to him, he sounded just like his daddy. I would to God when people see me they say he's just like his daddy somebody said well I didn't have that preacher it's good for you I'm glad and I'm happy for you but I didn't have that you know somebody else that didn't have that listen carefully Jonathan didn't have that do you realize that seven of son, Saul's sons will fail that day with nooses around their neck. But in verse 7 of the text, there was a grandson named Mephibosheth. He was a grandson of Saul. And you know he was spared. You know why? Because his daddy, Jonathan, who had the same daddy as the rest of the boys that hung, had the same daddy. But Jonathan, the Bible said in 1 Samuel 18 that David loved Jonathan and Jonathan loved David. It says it both ways as his own soul. Here's seven of Saul's sons that hung, Michael. And they're looking around saying, I wished I would have had an example. I wished I would have had an example. And the Bible does say their bloody house, maybe they were just as guilty as their daddy was. But they seen it from somewhere. But here's Mephibosheth. Mm -hmm. You know, David made a covenant with Mephibosheth. That as long as Mephibosheth lived, he would eat at the king's table. The seven sons died over there with those nooses. But Jonathan broke the trend. And Jonathan's son could have hung with his other grandsons. But Jonathan broke the trend. And now Mephibosheth is eating and dining with the king. I thank God. That I had a godly daddy, but some of you sitting here right now, Father's Day is hard for you. Because you think, I didn't have what you have, and it burdens me. Listen to me carefully. A lot of the things that some people have are a product of God's goodness and grace. And maybe if you did not have that, you know what you ought to do right now. Take a good lesson from Jonathan. And look at Mephibosheth dining at the table of the king. And they... And think to yourself, maybe I didn't have it, but one thing I'm sure, I was talking to a man this week. And I told him this story. And he got so excited about it that he went to his church in Crossville and used my outline to teach Sunday school. He said, I can't do that. That's your outline. God didn't give that to me. I said, you sing Amazing Grace, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, did you write it? I said, use it and help somebody else. And here's what his testimony about his daddy was. He said, my daddy was a good man. And he loved us and he worked hard. He said, but he did things that only I seen him do behind closed doors. And he said, one thing he done was he would drink alcohol behind closed doors. And when I was a teenager, he gave me a sip of that. And he said, when he gave me a sip of that, I developed a taste for that. And he said, to this day, preacher, I still struggle with it. To this very day, I still struggle with it. And he said, by the grace of God, I want to make sure while my daddy was good and while I love him and while I'm not trying to take anything away from him, there's some things he did that I want to make sure I do not pass on to my children.
every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. Stand to your feet for just a minute. Bandy's coming up.